Today we'll be looking into how a deaf student works in a television program and how ADHD affects college students. Hello, I'm your host, James Edwards. ADHD is a big problem affecting many college students. Some companies develop programs to help people with ADHD be successful in work and school. To get more information on ADHD, we asked Jake Barons, MD, from Envisions ADHD Clinic in Mequon, Wisconsin. Hello and welcome, Jake. Hello. Yes, thank you for having me on here. Tell us about what Envision does for adults. Sure. Well, I guess I'm a psychiatrist in here that was specializing in ADHD in adults, which I really came to enjoy back in residency, but finding, uh, I guess, of seeing how difficult it was for especially, you know, busy working or in school people to be able to be, be diagnosed and be able to get treatment in the way that was kind of most efficient for them. So I actually came from Madison to, to Milwaukee about three years ago to, to develop Envision ADHD to utilize a lot more of, you know, accessible technology in terms of doing things over video to eliminate commutes and waiting rooms and hopefully be able to make it a lot more accessible, easier to bring in more thorough diagnosis and then easier follow-up so that my whole idea is I want people to be able to focus on school, at work, on home and relationships and not just waiting for a visit with me. Okay. You had mentioned Madison. Mm -hmm. With the vision, is this company only located in Madison and Mequon or is there more than just those two yeah. locations? I'm physically located here in Milwaukee. I recently moved the clinic up to Mequon, but the whole idea of it is we only meet in person and one time to establish care, um, obtain um, vitals. Then after that, everything you can do remotely. So people are able to do all their follow-ups from their phone or from their computer. So that I actually work with a lot of people still from Madison, actually from all over the state, who commute down for the one-time visit because it's still often faster, easier. They make that one visit, and then we can do everything else right from okay. remotely right from their home. Okay, for those of us that do not know, what does ADHD actually stand for and what is it? Yeah, we have, well, technically attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Mm -hmm. Really a name I think is very diminutive to it. But the whole idea in here is, I always think of it more in terms of executive function, our ability to um, prioritize, organize, and then ultimately inhibit or put the brakes on the, everything else that's going on. I often think more of ADHD as this kind of, you have this Ferrari engine of a brain that's banging on all cylinders that inevitably life's going to throw road construction, traffic, curves into the kind of in front of you. And if you don't have your brakes finely tuned, I don't care how good of an engine you have, you're going to get yourself into trouble. Okay. So I think so much of it is what we want to do is it's a gift. You have this high revving machine. We just want to hone your brakes okay. versus fight it or take it away. Okay. With HDHD, how is it actually diagnosed? So much technically, from a you know, from a psychiatric standpoint, using the um, diagnostic statistical manual, is it's it's a what you call a clinical diagnosis. So it's based on history. So what you're looking for are symptoms of either of inattention or of hyperactivity, impulsivity, that have been present since before the age of 12, have been affecting you in multiple domains of life, work, school, home, relationships. Um, and that is causing an impairment in, in some way that's affecting life. Okay. And with ADHD, is there like different levels to that? Technically, you have um, you have levels. You know, you could technically classify as mild, moderate, severe, based on the level of functioning. And technically, with it, you had prior terms such as ADD or attention deficit disorder versus ADHD, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. That's really been combined now to just the one term ADHD with different specifiers such as predominantly inattentive type, predominantly hyperactive impulsive type, or okay. combined type. Okay. And um, what different programs are out there for the different ADHD since you mentioned there's different levels to it as um, as treatment? In terms of treatment? Mm -hmm. Well, a lot of time it's going to, you know, people will start by speaking to, often, you know, if it's, say, it's on referral from a teacher, some things are done in schools, but oftentimes it'll be seeing their primary care um, phys physician or a therapist or working with a psychiatrist. And oftentimes what it's, you know, some places might require more quote-unquote testing, of different types of neuropsych testing, but technically the diagnosis itself is all from a clinical diagnosis. Okay. And people can work with, you know, certainly aspects from medications, 
for therapy or coaching, for different types of accommodations, even getting at other type of lifestyle things, make sure you rule other things out, such as issues with sleep, with other mental health conditions, with substance use. Okay. So you can come at it from many different angles, and I always think the best approach is coming at it from a full menu of options that you can utilize. Okay, perfect. <laughs> um, with these different options, being that you mentioned you can start as young as the age of 12 as far as having ADHD, is this something that it's, you're born with, or is this something that over the test of time, it, it's some kind of... Yeah, and that's it's you know, something you. It's certainly not that you can't have it sooner. It's just okay. technically when I, I work with adults, okay. and it, in the the criteria, you have to have been able to show symptoms before age twelve. Okay. But a lot of times, you know, if I'm thinking of what's going on in the brain, is a lot of times we're thinking of the we call the prefrontal cortex, mm -hmm. area of executive function. But this is also the area; it's the last part of the of the brain to develop in childhood. Okay. So you know, technically, you could see symptoms in children, which is likely going to be there, and it. It might be a question is, is it just developmental delay? Is the child younger for their age? Okay. You know, potentially, is it, do they start school year earlier than they might have? Or are you just waiting for that development? So it can be at any age, but it's, I guess it'll be different in, in childhood. Is, is the child still developing and will they get there? You know, by the time you get to adulthood, you're looking, and if you see that consistent um, repetitive pattern, that's what we're looking for. Okay. And to get it to envision to ADHD, you have to get it with a doctor referral, or is it someone I can come directly off the street? How do I actually get in contact with your company to sit there to have myself yeah. or my child tested for that? My my passion is to bring to healthcare is something that I, I I'm very passionate about bringing consistency and transparency to mm -hmm. healthcare. Um, so in this is it doesn't matter who you are, you know exactly envisionadc.com. You can see exactly how the program works. I want to be as transparent as possible with prices, what's all included, and how it works. Um, and the same idea that you can just click schedule now, see the available services, see available times, click and be scheduled. Um, I know myself, even if I want to get a haircut, if I have to pick up the phone and go back and forth if a time's available, right. I'm not going to do it. Um, the whole idea here is it came the first time, I remember going to an Apple store at the Genius Bar where I could just like click and schedule a time. That was probably 15 years ago now. Uh, but that's exactly what I wanted to bring to healthcare because I know that's the only way I go and get services anymore. Okay. And as far as how did you actually get into this field? You know, most people either had a family member that may have had ADHD and it was a passion of theirs because you mentioned the word passion. Mm -hmm. There was a passion to find out more about so I can help other people when I could help my family member. Yeah. I was, I guess I could go back a while. <laughs> Even my, myself, it was, I, I, I was not someone that was like, oh my gosh, I'm going to go into psychiatry. Mm -hmm. I knew. Medicine I was certainly excited by. I'm a weird guy that actually liked technology, so it was really odd that I went into to psychiatry, but I saw emerging kind of fields that I could get into. And it was during residency when I was working with, it was actually um, a lot of Epic, a large consulting company, um, health record company in Madison. And I was working with a lot of people who I considered much more my, my peers. Okay. Out of college, incredibly bright, traveling, trying to get in to be able to have help with with something I saw, it's not like, oh my gosh, you have this terrible negative condition, mm -hmm. but it's more, you have a gift, we want to hone it. These were my peers who I liked seeing them come in, that liked using the high-tech software that I was building so mm -hmm. we could track outcomes and see changes over time. Okay. And what I liked is I would see people get better, see major results, and it, even the treatments are much more hands-on where it's, okay. we fine-tune a treatment versus just saying, here, take this and tell me how you're doing in six weeks. Okay. And that's what really got me involved. The people were excited by the tools that I was building. I would see progress. And I would say, th these are my peers. These are the people that I would you know, want to say hi to on, on the street, want to be kind of connected with. And that became a niche that I saw, especially in adults, it was kind of a diagnosis that at least my, my colleagues didn't want to touch. Like, if you're a successful, high-functioning individual, you can't have ADHD. And I, I'm saying, ADHD does not mean failure. Okay. And that was the big concern so it became a great niche because other people didn't want to get into it and it was something I was just waving a flag please bring these things my way okay okay now with your program is it accessible to everyone do you take this and offer this all field services like various colleges because you know some college students are like we're talking discussing today have been diagnosed with ADHD and need accommodations do you reach out to some of those schools to try to set up a program to help them out uh, um, a lot of like college students and people will find me and they can find okay. me online and get, get in there. I say I don't 
specific, I know that's where a lot of the stigma is, I think, with ADHDs, thinking are college students trying to get diagnosed, or are they trying to get the medications? Right. So I'd say I do not specifically market to okay. colleges, okay. but where it comes in is if people can find and get set up, a lot of times it's actually parents, even in other states, who are calling, trying to find okay. services for their, for their children. I much prefer when the, the patient, i.e. The, the student, reaches out to me directly. Okay. I try and make myself okay. as accessible as possible. Um, but that, that's all available. Everything is kind of set up. I actually run more of a um, kind of more like, I guess, a monthly subscription type of thing. So you have unlimited visits, but more importantly, you just have direct messaging with me. Okay. That way, care is, happens in far more than just when we meet face to face. Okay. And you had mentioned the company in Madison as well as the Met Um I, I moved, uh, so I moved, so my entire presence is here okay. in the Milwaukee area. Okay. I service people from all over the state, okay. where people, they often find it easier and faster to still schedule. The average wait time to see a psychiatrist is generally two to six months. Okay. Some of them might require you to go for extra quote unquote testing. That might be another three to six months out. Okay. So in here, if we can get a much more thorough diagnosis, all done directly with your physician, who's also the person that's going to be treating you, just to try and streamline that process. Wow. We learned a lot about how to help students with ADHD. Our next story is about a young man that despite being deaf, has a bright future in a television production program. Every Monday and Wednesday morning at 8.30, <laughs> Eric Murphy arrives at Milwaukee Area Technical College's downtown campus. Here is where Eric attends the television production program. Eric is not your typical TVP student. Eric is deaf. Most people would ask, how can he do television if he's deaf? Well, Eric shows them with the help of the television program teachers and MATC's accommodations office. We got to sit down and talk to Eric about being in the television production program. I decided to do a television major because like everyone I grew up watching all different television shows and of course enjoyed them. I love the creativity of the story. I felt like it was an escape for me to kind of dive into another world and I felt that was what was special about TV and I really wanted to use my influence to bring awareness to deaf people in the industry. I'd love to see deaf people thrive and I'd like some awareness. People saying, wow, deaf people can act or deaf people can be part of this industry. One thing that helps me be successful in my classroom is, well, first and foremost, I have to have accessibility accommodations, one of them obviously being a sign language interpreter in class that I can watch and understand everything that's going on in class from the lectures to what other students in the class are saying, their questions perhaps, or group, group work or projects. I have an interpreter available so that I have access to that information. That's inside of class, but outside of class I study. I memorize the materials, I practice just like anyone else and apply those skills when I get it back in the classroom and that's how I'm successful. We also sat down with Eric's instructor, Glenn Riley. A challenge too, not so much as far as the student is concerned, but for me, making sure that whatever I talk about, I'm enunciating my words for the interpreter so they hear it and interpret it to the student. Eric is going to have a bunch of challenges, obviously. Um, and in this field. Uh, the things that I think that he'll be good at is going to be like graphics, um, maybe lighting, but I think it might be harder for him as far as editing because you, you got to understand and listen to sound, understand how sound works with video. Floor directing, you know, having your headset on and listening to your directors and producers. Any type of live production is going to be a little bit of a detriment to him. Uh, field production work, just getting that. I mean, you could you could see the meters on your camera go up and down, the meters on the board going up and down if you're doing audio, but that doesn't mean that, that's, that the person's talking. It could be them tapping their mic with a pen. It could be jewelry hitting their mic. But if you're looking at it, you say, oh, they're talking, they look good. So in order for him to do something like that, to be successful in it, he would have to actually have a monitor, a screenshot of whoever's talking at the time so he can see that there is no uh, problems with the mic being manip manipulated or touched or um, you know anything hitting it uh, for it to work out for him to do audio. 
Hanging out with Eric, we see he has a plan on changing television for deaf people. We hope Eric's plan for more deaf people in television program comes true. Our next guest has worked in higher education for 15 years with students who experience physical and learning disability. We welcome Mary Louise Ross to the show. Ms. Ross, what are accommodations? Accommodations are an attempt from our colleges and universities to help students who have physical and emotional and cognitive disabilities to be able to have a full participation in the college experience. We want to make sure that students have equal access as well as full participation in the higher education experience. And the way to do that is to make sure that they have accommodations. And when we talk about accommodations, we're talking about the ability to help them be able to gain that type of access. So example, if I'm a student and I have a physical disability, let's say that I am deaf. And so in order to have a full participation in the educational environment, I would need a, an interpreter. And so in order for me to be able to be engaged in that environment, I would then need to have an accommodation of an interpreter. So there are several types of accommodations, and the accommodations are really based upon what the student is diagnosed with. And we figure that out during their intake appointment. And with this accommodation that you offer, how do you actually qualify? How do you go about getting those accommodations? Well, students qualify for accommodations once they have a medical diagnosis or a diagnosis from a medical professional. And they would need to bring that medical professional diagnosis to the accommodations office. Once they do that, then there is a process. Each school has their own intake process. But every school will require a student to bring in medical documentation as evidence of that disability. Once they do that, then the institution then will have an individual conversation with a disability coordinator or someone individually to talk with the student about, tell me a little bit about how your disability impacts you in this educational environment. And during that intake, there's the conversation to figure out where are your challenges in this environment. And then we look at accommodations to try to help a student be successful and nullify the effects of that disability in this educational environment. And as a result, then students are able to be successful and have a full engagement in the college experience. And so for us, what our role is, is to be able to have that individual appointment, that intake appointment, as well we decide on what the accommodations are. And with these accommodations that you offer, is there a fee that as a student I would have to pay additional to get the accommodations that, that may be required for me? No, there is no fee. Uh, students receive accommodations for a documented disability because of the Americans with Disability Act. There are three federal laws that protect students with disabilities. The three are the Americans with Disability Act, Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act, and then the Fair Housing Act. Those three federal laws are what protects students and requires colleges and education to provide support for students with documented disabilities so that they can have full participation and engagement in the college experience. We want to make sure that they have equal access. They are not to be discriminated against. They are about to be <coughs> in this environment so that they can have a full and rich life. And so it is free to students because of the Americans with Disability Act. And so they would come into our office and then we have a, a responsibility to help students who are disability to understand how to navigate our resources. Um, in my role as someone who works with students with disabilities, one of the things that I really try to do for students is teach them what their disability is and to help them understand what are the resources that they need to be effective. What are the strategies that you use as a person with disability in order to be successful and a full participation in this educational environment? So our role, even in the Disability Services Office, is to educate a student, teach them. Students are not required to tell students, tell their teachers, to tell anyone what their disability is. It is the student's responsibility to explain what their accommodations are and how their instructors in their classroom can support them. But a student at the college level is never to disclose their disability because we don't want students to be, have a stigma. And some people have biases based upon certain disabilities. And so because of that, what we try to do is to teach students how 
they can talk to their instructors about their accommodations. What the law wants us to do is to make sure that students are able to do the essential functions of that job, essential functions as a student. And so what does that really mean? That means that we as an institution cannot change our courses to accommodate a student's disability. What we can do is the student, no matter what their disability is, has to be able to do the essential functions of that course. And so if a student isn't able to do that, then they're not able to take that course or to obtain that degree. Um, one student that I work with really comes to mind and I think is just evident of what I'm talking about. Um, I had a student who was in a phlebotomy course. And as you know, phlebotomy is basically taking blood from someone. And so the student started out taking this class. They did not come to the Office of Disability Service and say that they had um, uncontrollable seizures. They just went and took, signed up for this phlebotomy course. We don't ask students before they apply to a college, do you have a disability? We assume that if they have a disability and they need accommodations, that we'll provide those, but we don't seek those students out. What we did for this particular student is, during the middle of their class, they go into a seizure. And so the instructor's concerned because there's no way that this student is going to be able to be a phlebotomist or even what student or what individual be willing to let somebody stick you if you have uncontrollable seizures. And so our office really was in a very precarious situation because we have a student that cannot do the essential functions of this course. They cannot take a needle and stick this person to take their blood. They can't because they might go into a seizure at that moment. And so to me, that really is an example of when we have a student that cannot do the central function of the course, and they cannot be in that course. There's nothing we can do because we cannot have that student harm someone else as a result of them having a disability. And we don't change the test or have the student uh, stick a dummy because that's not what the course is. The course is that you have to be a phlebotomist. You had mentioned previously with um, the accommodations as far as a, a deaf student, that you provide an interpreter. What are the programs and devices that you provide for, for, for college students to help them with their accommodations? It, it really depends, like I said, on the diagnosis. Um, I've had students where we've been able to um, provide interpreters. We've had students where we've been able to um, allow them to have um, emotional support animals um, in our residence halls in particular. Um, I've had students that have some cognitive disabilities, and as a result of those cognitive disabilities, we've used technologies like Kurzweil. Um, we've used things like SmartPen. Um, we've also, particularly for students with ADHD, sometimes they struggle with organization, and so we've done things in regards to try to help them use their phone. There are a lot of free apps that are available nowadays to help students stay organized and to remind students of doing things. Um, we also, when it comes to working with students with disabilities and providing accommodations with them, typically they're like extended time on tests. We can provide note takers for students. Um, I talk about adaptive technology tools. Um, there are things we use where people can take tests in a private room, um, a non-distracted environment when they would take tests. Um, we have situations like JAWS where tests are read to students. So accommodations really differ depending on what the disability is. One of the things I do charge our students with is you need to understand how your disability impacts you. Because w to me, one of the greatest inventions that <laughs> we as society use every day, many people use every day, and is the, the, the pill bottle. Um, I know most people, you go to a dollar store, any store, and there are these bottles where you uh -huh. see Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Mm -hmm. And it was someone who had a disability uh -huh. or struggled in order to remember to take their pills that created wow. this, this device for them to be successful. And so one of the things mm -hmm. we encourage students to do is to really understand how your disability impacts you in different environments because you may have uh -huh. to create okay. that adaptive technology for you. You okay. may have to do it for yourself okay. in order to be okay. successful okay. in any environment. Okay. Well, we thank you, Ms. Ross, for coming on the show today and talking with me about student accommodations. I would also like to thank Mr. Barron for coming on the show and talking about his company, Envision ADHD. 
Well, that's all the time we have for today. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of Heart, Heart Learning. I'm James Edwards, wishing you a wonderful evening and hope to see you on the next episode of Hard Learning. Good night.